All right, we're going to talk today about the sinner's prayer, or the prayer of salvation, praying a prayer. What we're going to talk about is, is it scriptural to pray, to ask God to be saved? Um, is this sinner's prayer that people recite, is that scriptural? Uh, and also, is prayer a work? You know, is that works-based salvation when you pray a prayer? That's what we're going to be talking about. And uh, let me just say here at the very beginning, um, if you followed this ministry for any length of time, you know that I oftentimes talk about false brethren, false converts, and things like that. And if you hear those sermons, I will oftentimes refer to people praying a prayer and thinking that that's what saved them. So, when you see this thing, you go to these big phallus houses, Babel buildings, whatever you want to call these things. They're not churches, because church is a reference to the people, not the building. And there's a whole lot of other issues. Watch my other sermons on that. But what happens is, you get to the end, and the guy put on a good show, I mean a sermon, and uh, he says, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you don't know for sure that you go to heaven when you die, friend, would you please pray this prayer? prayer? Repeat after me. You say, dear God, dear God, uh, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And I want to trust you and your death on the cross as the only payment for my sin." And they all repeat that. And he, he'll take you through this prayer. And he says, now, friend, if you've prayed that for the very first time, I can tell you that you're on your way to heaven. And now you need to be coming here and be part of the local church and give your tithes and offerings. Of course. You know, now I've rebuked that thing. All right. That is unbiblical. All right. And I've even heard them, you know, they'll do this thing. They'll say, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Now let's pray this prayer. Even if you've prayed it before, Let's pray it again. Repeat after me. And they will guilt trip the people there in the, in the crowd. They're not even a congregation. The crowd into praying this prayer. And then what the, these miserable, wicked devils up front, you know, the, the pastor or whatever, the speaker, they'll look around and they'll say, okay, there's uh, 40 people here today. 40 people prayed the prayer. Praise the Lord, we had 40 people saved. No, no, you didn't. And people say, well, Brian, you have a sinner's prayer in your salvation message. Yeah, but it's accompanied by a lot of scripture. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Is it ever right to say to a lost person, let me lead you in prayer to get saved? That's what we're going to talk about. Now, the big disputed passage that you're going to hear about is Romans chapter 10. So let's go there. We're actually going to see what Romans chapter 10, what's really going on there? Turn your Bible to Romans chapter 10. Okay, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It says here, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now let me ask you a question. Is the word prayer... In either of those two verses? No. And people say, well then, see, there's no prayer connected to salvation. Well, just hold on a second, though. Because let's continue here. Let's read down through to verse 13. I'm going to show you what's going on here. Verse 11, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon, call upon, the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Did the word prayer appear? No. But what about these two words, call upon? We're going to look at those two words today. You see, your King James Bible, and I've talked about this in numerous sermons, has a thing called the law of first mention. Where does this thing of call upon where does that show up first? Very interesting. Turn to Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. Way back to the beginning of your Bible. Genesis chapter 4, verse 26. And we're going to see about this call upon. What does this call upon mean? Okay, verse 26 says, And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, then began men to call upon 
the name of the Lord. So people were calling upon the name of the Lord way back there, at the very beginning of time, the very beginning of the creation that we have today, that we live in, the beginning of this world. Way back then, they were calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean they were just going around saying, God, 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 God? You know? No, they were calling upon him for a specific reason. We're going to see that as we continue through the study. Go next to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. For those of you who are new to the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. And, you know, and, and I just want to say this. Um, don't ever feel uncomfortable if you can't just flip to these books. You know, you've just been recently saved. It's going to take you a little bit of time, all right? You're going to have to read the Bible and study the Bible, and, and you'll get familiarity with these books of the Bible. And that's why it's nice to actually have a video sermon like this, because you can pause it, and if you, even if you have to go to the index in the front there to see where the book's at, that's fine. Don't feel ashamed about that, okay? Um, I oftentimes will try to give order of books while I'm turning to a book just to help out a new believer. All right, so I'm not trying to insult you if you've been saved for a while and you're going, oh, I know where the book's at, you know. I, you know, I'm trying to be sensitive to my newer viewers. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? Hmm. There you see it again. Call upon him. What is this call upon? It's prayer. The Bible term, call upon, in reference to the Lord, is prayer. Now, it doesn't say prayer in Romans 10, 13. I understand that. But the term there, call upon, is a reference to prayer. It is not a reference to publicly proclaiming that you believe in Jesus Christ and that you've made a public profession of faith. That is important. Okay? You are to confess the Lord openly among people and among relatives and stuff like that. That's true. But call upon is a reference to prayer. And we're actually going to see some verses where it's call upon and prayer is also used in the same verse, referring to the same thing. Turn next to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 8. A couple more books back towards the New Testament. It says here, Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. So when you call upon the name of the Lord as a saved person, which we'll be talking about this as we continue, when you call upon the name of the Lord, you're calling out to him. The Bible talks about praying in secret, and the Lord which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Okay? That's kind of like what's going on here. Make known his deeds among the people. So when you're praying for something and the Lord answers that prayer, it's a good thing to share it with other Christians. Like we did with our moving update here. I know a lot of you were praying for us. And we had some experiences moving here to Maine that there's just no rational explanation. The Lord was there protecting us. God answered not only our prayers, our puny little prayers that my wife and I were doing the whole way up, you know, but God answered your prayers too. God is in heaven hearing the prayers of his saints, all right? And we need to make known his deeds among each other. That's part of exhortation, all right? And it's a blessed thing too when you have people praying for relatives and those relatives get saved or praying for somebody else and they get saved and you tell other people about it. So it's a great blessing to hear that. But let's go to the next passage here. 
we're going to start to see some contrast between lost people not wanting to call upon the name of the Lord and saved people calling upon the name of the Lord. Psalm 14, verse 4. You know, it's been well said, I think the first person I ever heard say this, and it really stuck with me, they said that uh, a lost man can't find God for the same reason a thief can't find a police officer. There's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of lost people out there that don't call upon the name of the Lord. Why? Because they know it means a changed life. They know what salvation means. And you get a bunch of dumb Christians coming along saying there's no repentance. Don't ever tell a lost person that they have to change their life when they get saved. Um, many lost people, you don't have to tell them, they already know. They know salvation means a changed life. They understand that. That's why they don't want to call upon the name of the Lord. You know, yeah, if they're in dire straits, you know, the old foxhole syndrome, as they say, some guy over in war and he feels like he's going to die, he'll call out to God. You know, but a lot of times I'll go back to a, a wicked life after God saves them out of their problems, there, out of their trouble. But most people don't call upon the name of the Lord because they know it means a changed life. They, and, and I'm not talking about, well, you have to go to church or something, because that's not even in the Bible. What I'm saying is you have to clean your life up. You become a bond servant of Jesus Christ. You're bought. A lot of people don't want that. That's why they don't call upon the name of the Lord. But there are those who do call upon the name of the Lord. And we're going to, in this study, we're going to see when does that relationship start. That's what the real issue is here. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I have a tendency to do that. Psalm 14, verse 4. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord? Hmm. The workers of iniquity, he's, he's asking a question there. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Well, of course they have knowledge. They understand what's going on in the world. But you look at the, you know, it's, it's amazing. You look at people sometimes and you say to yourself, the Bible's being confirmed. There's no way this world happened by chance. I mean, evolution theory is the dumbest thing that there is. Everything came from nothing accidentally. You're insane if you believe that. Insane or in sin. See? And that's what most people are. They're in sin. The workers of iniquity do have knowledge. They do understand that there is a God, but they refuse to accept it because... They understand that's going to make changes in their life. That means that there are rules that they're going to have to keep and follow. That's why they don't want to call upon the name of the Lord. Psalm 18, verse 1 through 3. Now see the contrast here. That was the workers of iniquity in Psalm 14. Now look at the saved here. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation. He's saved. And my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. What would have been the purpose of David calling upon the Lord? To be saved from his enemies. Prayer. See? And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And I, you know, this is just kind of common sense, but I'll just say this for the purpose of the study. Uh, you have a lot of enemies as a Christian. Right? And most of them are spiritual. You can't even see them. That's scary when you think about it. I mean, it'd be like walking into a battlefield where everybody is a camouflage sniper and they all have their sights fixed on you and you got to walk through an open field with no place to hide that's scary and as a christian in this world your enemies i could there could be a devil right there and you'd never even know it you might feel kind of like oh something feels weird and i don't know something feels strange but the fact of the matter is there are devils all over the place sometimes they influence people okay more and more so as time goes by too but um, how do you have God's protection? By praying. Prayer is one of the most important things that you can do as a Christian. You know, the Bible does not say believe without ceasing. It does not say tithe without ceasing, although some people want it to say that. It does not say um, fast without ceasing. It does not say a lot of things. You know what it says? It says pray without ceasing. 
Prayer is one of the most important things that you do as a Christian, as a saved individual. And prayer is something that will cross dispensational lines. It's not just for a New Testament Christian. It's back here in the Old Testament. You know, they were justified differently than we are today, but they still prayed. Prayer was still very, very important back then. Prayer is always going to be important. We'll see that as we continue. Even in the future, when the Lord is physically present. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 15. Psalm 50 and verse 15 it says here, And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Again, we're seeing the same thing. A saved person calling upon the Lord, praying to the Lord to be delivered. All right? Go to, look at verse 16 through 18 here. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. So, the very fact of the matter is, God saved David from times of trouble. But with the wicked, the Lord's just kind of like, what do you have to, anything to do with me? Don't worry about my statutes. Don't worry about things like that, because you're just wicked. You don't care. You know? Interesting. Go next to Psalm 80. Psalm 80, verse 17. Okay, Psalm 80, verse 17 through 19 says, Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou madest strong for thyself. So will not we go back from thee, quicken us, quicken, you know, you get that in Ephesians chapter 2, I believe it is, you, you who are dead in trespasses and sins, you know, God's quickened you. Sorry, I didn't quote it perfectly, but, you know, you can look that up, Ephesians chapter 2. God quickens you when you get saved. But it says here, quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Hmm. Interesting there. Turn us again, you know. See, all these different things are happening there. I believe it's salvation. Your changed life happens at salvation. That doesn't mean you get instantly perfect and you don't sin after that. That doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean if you have a problem with some addiction of some kind that you instantly, it's gone at salvation. No, there are some people that it's a little stronger in their flesh and they struggle with it for a little while. You know, yeah, I understand that. But the point is, there is a change that happens at salvation. A big change. And part of that big change, I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit here, but part of the change that happens at salvation is, you learn to call upon the name of the Lord. Um, question. When does it start? When does your calling upon the name of the Lord, when does that begin? After you've been saved for a year? That's when you start to pray? No. It starts at salvation. That's when you first call upon the name of the Lord. And at that point, now you're talking to Him. Because, you see, up until that point, God wasn't really interested in your prayers. You get these national prayer breakfasts and stuff, and you see, like, Hillary Clinton, you know, praying or something. It's like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'm sure God's listening to her. You know, you get these wicked people praying, Oh, God, please bring peace to our nation and prosperity, of course. You know, God's not interested in that prayer. The only prayer that God is interested in from a lost, hell-bound sinner is the prayer coming to Him for salvation. You say, well, then there's a specific prayer that you have to pray with the exact words. No, no. You pray to God the best way you know how. You come to God and you say, God, please, I'm a sinner. Please, I need to get saved. And you pray whatever you pray. Okay? The only thing is, you're coming to God as a sinner. You're showing Him there's no more self-righteousness. I'm not counting on myself anymore to be saved. I'm here. I need to get saved. Please, God, save me. 
That's what starts the relationship. All right? You say, well, then the prayer of salvation is there, and then there's no belief and no faith and no repentance. No, that's all part of it, too. See, what people are trying to do is they're trying to dissect salvation, dissect the gospel, and they'd say, I don't like repentance, so I'll take that out. I just want it to be belief and no prayer. And, you know, well, I want it to be belief and repentance, but no prayer. Well, I want it to be belief and prayer, but, no, but you know, and repentance, but no faith. And I want it to be some works involved. See, that's what people are doing. They're trying to, to mess with the simplicity that is the gospel. And we're going to talk about that, and I'm going to show you some scriptures on that as we continue. But let's uh, look here. Psalm 86. Turn there. Psalm 86, verse 1 through 7. Okay, it says here, bow down, bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy, O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. Daily, you know, like praying without ceasing. Rejoice the soul of thy servant, uh, for, for unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Now look at this, look at verse 6. Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. Hmm. So what is calling upon the Lord? It's prayer. So what's going on there? I'm using the Bible to define bi biblical words. I'm not going to Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is fine in and of itself sometimes, but I'm not going to some other dictionary or some other source to prove what call upon means. The Bible defines itself. Call upon the Lord means to pray. That's what it means. Just using the Bible to define itself. Let's go to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. We're going to see about the thing of like the Bible says to pray without ceasing. Psalm 116, verse 1 and 2. It says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, like we just read about there. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Pray without ceasing. You got that? All right. Go down to verse 12 in Psalm 116. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Hmm. Salvation is tied to calling upon the name of the Lord. Before you're saved, there's really no point in calling upon the name of the Lord. But when you get saved... That now becomes one of the most important parts of your relationship. And that prayer begins at salvation. It isn't some kind of a thing that you pick up on down the road because one day it just kind of pops into your head. Maybe I ought to pray. Hey, there's a thought. I mean, I've always just believed on Jesus and I was saved for 10 years now, but I think I'm going to start to actually talk to God now. See how ridiculous that is? Your life and your relationship of praying to God, calling upon the name of the Lord, begins at your salvation. That's where it starts. Continuing, jump down to verse 16. O Lord, truly I am thy servant, I am thy servant, and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and will call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? We're to give thanks in everything, it says back there in the New Testament. And to pray without ceasing. And I have a sermon on the sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's an it's a interesting study. Uh, there are times that you're not going to be real thankful for what's going on in your life. There are times that you're going to get a flat tire when you're late going someplace. There are times that you're going to have a loved one die and you can't explain it. They were saved. There are times that you're going to get sick as a dog, but you need to thank God for those times. You say, well, Brian, that sounds kind of rough. Yeah, it's a sacrifice. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. And uh, how do you give the sacrifice of thanksgiving? By calling upon the name of the Lord. Prayer. 
That's how you offer it up. We'll continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. You can keep your hand there in, in uh, Psalm. We're going to be coming right back to that, but I just want to show you here a New Testament tie into the thing of that you're owned by God. And you ought to know this one anyhow. This is a verse I cover a lot here at this ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. <clears throat> Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. At salvation, you become God's property. You can go back to the book of Psalm there. In fact, go to Psalm 145. So, how would it be if there was a man that was a bondservant and uh, he never talked, never wanted to talk to his master? Um, that's not really your right. As a bondservant, you come in and you report for duty. And if your master says to you, hey, I want you to go work out in that field over there. Hey, I want you to go do this. Hey, I want you to do that. Hey, I want you... Yes, sir. That's the proper relationship of a bondservant to his master. You have to talk to your master. It's very important. When does it begin? When does this relationship begin? When that master sees you up there on the block and he says, Okay, I want that one. I'll take that guy right there. Here, here's the price I pay for him. My blood. The death of my son. There you go. Hey, you. You're mine now. Come here. You start talking at salvation. But the interesting thing about it is God's there. He'll buy anybody. Okay? There's no respect of persons with God. He'll take anybody as a bondservant. But they have to come to Him and ask Him with their mouth. See? And God's not interested in hearing any prayer from a lost person other than God have mercy on me, a sinner, which we'll see later. Psalm 145, uh, let's see, where are we at here? 17, verse 17 through 20. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He also will hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. Now, brother, that's back in the Old Testament. That's not for us today. Uh, well, it's in the Old Testament. I understand that. But you see, just because it's in the Old Testament doesn't mean you just totally... Anything in the Old Testament's not for us. That's not the purpose of right division. You see, there are certain things, certain concepts that cross dispensational lines. Certain things that are true in any dispensation. And the fact of the matter is, right there is a perfect type of our salvation today. What's going on there? The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him. Hey, where are you sitting right now? Is God nigh you? If you're lost, do you know that you can get saved right there? You don't have to come and be part of my local church to get saved. You don't have to go to some special city, some place to meet God. You know, Vatican City. Yeah, right. <laughs> Stay away from that place. You know, unless you're going there to pass out tracts, you know, then go. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is God is nigh. He is near. He is right there available to anyone who wants to call upon his name for salvation. He's right there. Right there. Okay, but look, it says there, to, to all that call upon him in truth. You see, there again, it kicks the thing of the false sinner's prayer. There's a real sinner's prayer where somebody is actually calling upon the Lord in truth, and then there's a false one where they're just repeating a prayer, and they're just kind of like, you know, I believe in Jesus Christ, died for my sins, and I hope that I can get out of here soon. Oh, what am I supposed to say next? Oh, yeah, you know, I don't want to... 
I actually met a preacher the one time that was on his front porch, and he said this guy was, these Baptists came to him, and they were really, really, really pushy, and uh, they just wouldn't take no for an answer. And finally, he was just like, okay, what do I need to do to become a Christian? And the guy said, repeat this prayer. And he repeated the prayer to get rid of the pushy evangelist. And fortunately for him, later on, he did actually get saved, and he himself became a Baptist pastor. But the point is, the first time he prayed the prayer, it was totally false, and he knew it was false. You see, he wasn't calling upon the name of the Lord in truth. He really wasn't a repentant sinner at that point in time. He really wasn't saying, God, please save me. There was no fear there. Again, you know, continuing here, he will fill the fulfill the desire of them that fear him. What's the fulfilling the desire there? What is it? I don't want to go to hell. I remember when I got saved, I was crying out to the Lord, and I'm saying, God, I'm scared to death. I was thinking about going to a place where it's pitch black darkness, and you're burning forever. No chance of escape. No chance of getting out of it. No chance of the pain being lessened. You'll never get used to that. Screaming, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. You know what my desire was that I wanted to have fulfilled? I wanted to know that I was saved. And I knew because of my faith, my repentance, my belief, and my calling upon the name of the Lord. That's how I knew. All those aspects were there. And it wasn't that I had this checklist and I had to go down through and say, okay, now God, I am coming to you in a repentant state. Okay, I got that one. Okay, now God, I am putting my faith in you because I believe in you. Oh, two more. And now I'm praying to you so there... No, it wasn't that. It's all one thing. All right? It's all part of the same thing, the gospel. But I didn't want to, you know, these people are trying to remove little parts of it and remove the prayer, remove repentance, remove this, remove that. That's wickedness. Those things are all supposed to be there. But, continuing here, and you, verse 20, we'll just say this yet, the Lord preserveth all them that love him. Okay? Truly loving the Lord is accepting his son, Jesus Christ. And what does he do? He preserves us, today especially, you know. Preserving us how? Well, we're sealed until the day of redemption. You know, if you get some, uh, some kind of uh, fruits or vegetables or something like that, you know how you preserve them? Well, let me ask you, how do you preserve them? By opening up the container and sitting it outdoors? Or by sealing them? Sealing. That's how we're preserved. As Christians. So, this verse here in Psalm, these verses, excuse me, in Psalm 145, verses 17 through 20, they were true back then for David, but they're even more so for us today. And anybody at all can call upon the name of the Lord in truth, and God will save them. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a wonderful promise. And something's wrong with you if you're trying to tell people, no, that has nothing to do with salvation. Don't call upon the name of the Lord for salvation. Just believe. See, the problem with that is we continue. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Verse... Uh, written down on this list here. Isaiah 55, verse 6 and 7. Okay, it says here, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Remember what the Bible said earlier about he is nigh thee? Nigh is another word for near. Alright, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Call ye upon him while he is near. You see, I do believe that there are people 
that have gotten to such a point where they can't get saved. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to witness to them, you know. I think there are, everybody should witness, you know, you should witness to anybody no matter what. But I really do believe the Bible talks about let not your hearts be hardened. And I think that there are people that have rejected Jesus Christ so many times, and I, you know, I can't tell that, so that's why you witness to them. But there are people that have rejected Jesus Christ time and time and time and time and time again, and each time you do it, the first time you do it, you're a child of disobedience, and you become a child of wrath. But the more you do it, the more God pulls back and pulls back and pulls back and pulls back and pulls back, and pretty soon he's so far away from you that for you to get saved, it's going to be real tough. And I've heard story after story after story. Um, I remember one of my brothers, um, spiritual brothers I'm talking about, he told me the story about his father. And he said his father had lost like over 90% of the functionality of his heart. And he came to his dad and he said, Dad, you need to get saved. And you know what his dad said? Laying there on his deathbed, he says, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> well, when are you going to be ready? You know, when you got one foot in the grave, I mean, you know, crazy. What's going on there? Well, you reject the Lord, and reject the Lord, and you reject the Lord, and you reject the Lord, and you reject Him again. Pretty soon it's going to be very tough for you to get saved. I'm not saying it's impossible, but what I'm saying is it becomes very difficult. You know, it's kind of like when you have a problem in your home, kind of like a leaky roof or something like that, you don't take care of it. Guess what? It gets bigger. The leak gets worse. Leaks don't get better over time. They get worse. And that leak gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you got yourself a real problem. And it can get to such a point that the whole house will fall down. And then you can't fix it. All you can do is bulldoze the house in. I've seen houses like that. And the people are very, very similar. They reject Christ so many times that eventually... All that's left for him is to go into the grave. See, at the great white throne judgment. If you're not saved, you better get saved. Go next to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah 10, verse 24 and 25. It says here, O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. Who's he talking about? Lost people. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. Does the wrath of God come upon those that have been called upon him? Yeah. But now let's think about that. Does God send his wrath on people that can't do anything about it? No. That's Calvinism, okay? Hyper-Calvinism. There's the elect, and there's the non-elect. And if you're not elect, you can't do anything to be one of the elect. You're just chosen before eternity to be damned to hell. That's stupid. That's extremely stupid. You know? What's going on there is God's wrath... He judges people that have the ability to call upon Him, but they choose not to because they don't want to be rebuked for their sin. That's the issue. God will never judge a people that have no free will. That's why the Bible says that God does not judge little children. Okay? If they have not reached that age of accountability, there is no... Uh, I can't think of how the scripture goes right now. I don't have it written down. But there's, there's no... Um, judgment where there is no knowledge of the law, basically. It's in Romans, I think chapter 4. I'm sorry, don't have it written down right now. But the point is, God's not going to judge a child. They could be born to Satanists, okay? They could be born to witches, to be, be born to, you know, the Pope and one of his nuns or something like that. I mean, we're talking, to, to, they could be born to the most wicked people out there, and God's not going to judge them until they have the knowledge of sin, until they can understand, I've sinned against God. See, God will not judge a people that have no ability to get saved. But God will judge a people that do not want to call upon His name. See, they have that ability to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. 
and they refuse, and so God judges them. That's very important to realize. Turn next to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Okay, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, now look at this, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Again, we see call upon and pray are synonymous. They're used the same way. So, the word pray is not in Romans chapter 9, or Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, but it does say call upon in verse 13. It's a reference to prayer. That's what it's a reference to. It's not a reference to going out and publicly proclaiming Jesus Christ to save you, or something like this, or confessing Him before men. That's not a reference to that. It's a reference to prayer. Go next to Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. If you're new to being saved, you're probably almost definitely going to have to look this one up in the index. These little books of the minor prophets are hard to find. Of course, my pages are sticking together. Zephaniah 3, verses 8 and 9. Okay, it says here, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger for all the earth shall be devour, devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Who's going to bring in the new world order? God is. He's allowing these guys, these globalists, to all come together and congregate together so he can just go and destroy them all at once. Verse 9, now look at this. For then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. You see, in that millennial kingdom, in that time period that's going to come, Jesus Christ is going to be physically on the earth, and he cuts off all the names of the idols and all false cults out there. So all the religions and everything else that are on the earth is just going to go down to one. Why? Because God's going to be on the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And we, his saints, are going to be out there ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ as kings and priests. So there are going to be those of us that are in ruling positions, those of us are in teaching and preaching positions. Very interesting. You say, well, how do I get which one? And, well, I believe it's based on your service, not believe. It is definitely based on your service to God here in this life. And if you mess up and you don't read your Bible and you don't pray and you don't witness and you don't do anything for the Lord and you just kind of live like the world and you're a carnal Christian and you're genuinely saved, well, you're not going to have much of a millennial inheritance, if anything at all. Okay, um, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. How do you suffer? You suffer by serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The suffering comes automatically. <laughs> okay, You know what I'm talking about if you serve the Lord. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. I see another reference to the thing of calling upon the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So again, he's talking about saved people. Now saved people are going to pray. We're the ones that we're supposed to be praying all the time. But like I've been saying, when does the prayer start? It starts at your salvation. That's when you first call upon the name of the Lord. Alright? 
switch my page over here. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. Okay, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Cry. Now see, if I wanted to adopt a son, let's say, would there be any point in the boy talking to me before and calling me father when I'm not even his adopted father yet? No. When does the boy start to talk to me? When I come in there and purchase him because it costs a lot of money to adopt from what I've heard. I come in there to purchase my new son. Now he can call me father. See? Well, it's the same thing with us in the Lord. Why would you call God your father when you're not saved? But you see, you come to God and you say, Dear God, please, save me. At that point in time, when He saves you, now He's your Father. Now you start to talk to Him. But it starts at salvation. Like I keep saying. And you say, well, could you give me an example of this? I don't think that you've proved your point, Brian. You need to show us, us an example. Okay? Turn to Luke. Luke 18, Luke 18, verse 9. You say, I don't think that lost people can't pray to God. They can't pray to God. You just believe and you come to Him and, and just start believing and then you pray later on when you feel like it or something. Uh, I'm going to show you that's false. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 and 10. And He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. There are a lot of people out there that are self-righteous. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Question, were these men saved? No. Why did they go up to pray? Well, we'll see why as we continue. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Wow. I'm impressed, aren't you? You know, I'm sure the Lord was really impressed with this guy. But now look at the publican. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, believing God and saying, Be merciful. Or, no, I'm sorry, you can't say it. Believing God. And he went out justified, right? No, it says, uh, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, he realizes his problem. He realizes, I'm a sinner. And I can't do anything about it. And now he's beginning to call upon the name of the Lord in truth and in fear. Why would he pray to God, be merciful to me? Why? Because he fears God. He knows what's going to happen when he dies. See? See? He understands that, and he's saying, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. He's calling upon the name of the Lord in truth. He's not calling upon the name of the Lord like the Pharisee. The Pharisee's not calling upon the name of the Lord in truth. He's there with his own self-righteousness. He's trusting in himself. He's saying, I've done all these good things. Surely God wouldn't send a fine man like me to hell. See, I'm not like that dirty publican over there. A lot of self-righteous people do that. But let's see what happened here. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Think about eternity. I exalt myself. I am the vicar of Christ. I am the Pope. Pope Pius, the such and such. Or Pope uh, Francis, you know, whatever number he is, 666, I guess. You know, I am the Pope. Oh, everybody bows to me. Kiss my ring. Kiss my, my foot. You know, whatever. And what's he do? Gets up there, stands before God. God says, depart from me, you cursed in everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Go down there. Down he goes. Naked, 
burning in flames, screaming, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. Some guy there beside him is a drug addict. This guy over here is a knife murderer. That woman over there was a prostitute, died of a heroin overdose. And there's the Pope. Hey! <laughs> he exalted himself, but he's a beast. And in this life, that wicked sinner out there, like I once was, humbled myself and I said, God, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm a sinner. God, be merciful to me. I called upon the name of the Lord, and God took me and said, okay, I'm going to exalt you. Someday, this old, old flesh here, this thing that you're seeing, this is all going to be gone. I'm going to be an eternal being ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. Immortal being up there with the Lord for eternity. It's hard for me to believe sometimes. Just a simple nobody, a nothing, you know. I found out this year, it's kind of funny, you know, somebody said, I was talking about my truck or insurance or something, I forget, and they said, oh, it's a classic vehicle. And I was like, huh? And she said, 20-year-old vehicles are classic vehicles. And I just realized this year my truck turns 20 years old. You know, I always figured it was a newer truck, you know. And it's like, it's a classic vehicle now, you know. We, you know, we don't have much money. We, we're just simple, common people and stuff like that. But guess what? One day I'm going to be a king or a priest, whichever the Lord decides to do for me, you know, uh, to give me. You know, not do for me, but to, to give me. You know, one day I'm going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ and I'm going to be rewarded. I can't understand all that. But you see, it starts out with humbling yourself here and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's how it starts. You say, but doesn't the Bible say that God heareth not sinners? Ah, huh, we got you this time, Brian. The Bible says God heareth not sinners. Ha, ah, we got you. So a sinner can't pray the prayer of salvation because God hears not sinners. Let's look about that. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. We're going to read verse 26 through 34 to get in context instead of just ripping verses out and trying to prove warped doctrines. John chapter 9, verse 26. Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? Jesus heals the blind man, you know. He answered them, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. The old Pharisees again. We know that God spake unto Moses, As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. <laughs> it's incredible. Here you have Jesus Christ going around, and he opens the eyes of a man who's born blind. You know? And they're going, I don't know who he is or from whence he is. I don't know who's behind him. Well, give me a break. You know? Look what the guy says, verse 30. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. So what's going on there? Why did this man say, God heareth not sinners? Why? Because he was talking about miracles. The power to do miracles. If Jesus Christ was a sinner, if he was a bad man, God wouldn't have heard him. This has nothing to do with a sinner coming to God for salvation. It's talking about miracle power. It doesn't have a thing in the world to do with a sinner coming in a repentant state and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> so it's a stupid argument to try and say, oh, God, the Bible says God heareth not sinners, therefore, you know, that a sinner can't come to God and pray. You're taking that verse completely out of context if you use that. Stupid argument. Don't use that one. You say, 
Okay, but the Bible says that every mouth may be stopped. What are you going to do with that? Let's look about that. Romans chapter 3. Get a lot of false prophets out there today, and they just quote a scripture or two to try and prove things, and they're ripping them completely out of context. So let's see if this has to do with our salvation. Okay, let's see what this has to do with. Romans chapter 3, verse... 10, I'm going to read down through verse 20. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit. The, poisons of, or the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that, whatso, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world be, may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. What's going on there in the passage? Very simple. God is saying, nobody's going to come to me anymore and say, I'm justified by the deeds of the law. Every mouth is now stopped. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. So you can't come along and you can't say, hey, I've kept the Ten Commandments from my youth. Even if you could do a thing like that, even if you had somebody that really truly had, it doesn't matter. Because the means of salvation today, right now, is Justification through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill the law and to put away those Old Testament systems of sacrifices. That thing is gone. It is done now. So those people that were trying to be justified by keeping the law, their mouths were now stopped. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. Don't try to go back under the law and justify yourself that way. Shut up, in other words, if you're trying to justify yourself by the deeds of the law. The deeds of the law are only there now to convict you and show you that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ. But again, to use this as an argument to go against the sinner's prayer shows a high degree of ignorance of Scripture. All right? It's not trying to prove that there's no prayer involved with salvation. It's simply saying you can't be justified by the deeds of the law. Don't try it. Your mouth needs to be stopped. That's all it's saying. Again, a stupid argument. But, uh, you know, people will say, but prayer is obviously a good work. And we've proved that prayer is a good work. Well, let's check about that. Romans chapter 15, verse 30. Romans 15, verse 30. Does prayer take work? Well, let's, let's see these deep scriptures here. Romans 15, verse 30, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Wow. So, prayer is, you strive in prayer. That proves that prayer is a work. So then that would be works-based salvation. Um, were those guys uh, striving there in prayer to be saved? No, they weren't. You see, what's going on there is the fact that after you're saved, you'll strive in prayer. But that prayer of salvation that you pray when you first come to God and say, I mean, what did the, what did the publicans say? God, be merciful. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Seven words. Is that striving in prayer? No. It's a simple prayer. And you come into the Lord as a sinner and, and fall down on your knees and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's not striving. So what these people do is they'll go to something that happens after your salvation, that you're supposed to do after your salvation, and they say, see, that's work there. So then that proves that the lost person coming to God, they're working to get saved there. So it works, prayer is a work. And... Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. I mean, it's like saying, you know, 
We're supposed to witness to the lost. We're ministers of reconciliation. Therefore, a lost person can't be saved because they can't be a minister of reconciliation. Huh? So you take something that somebody does after they've been saved for a while, striving in prayer, and you say, that takes work to strive in prayer, so if somebody prays to get saved, that's work. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Well, if you're half crazy, it does. Let's look at another one here. Colossians 4, verse 12. Went too far. Colossians 4, one more page. Colossians 4 and verse 12. Let's look here again. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Uh, when's the last time you saw a lost person laboring fervently in prayer for saved people? I never have. You know, you say, well, Catholics labor fervently in prayer. No, they labor fervently in vain repetition. You know, O oh Mary, Mother of God, blessed be the fruit of the loom, and hallowed be the, the tomb and of the womb, and the, you know, whatever they say, I don't even know. You know, they, they, they throw up uh, ten Hail Marys to the Lord, and they expect to get out of purgatory better for that or something. That's not laboring fervently in prayer, you know? And they're not even doing that to get saved. If you go to a, a devout Roman Catholic and say, what did you do? And they, and they got blood on their knees and stuff like that because they were down on their knees laboring fervently in prayer for the last, you know, six hours or something like that. You go to them and you'd say, you've been praying this whole time? Yes, yes, bless God. And you say, uh, are you saved? A devout Catholic will say, no, that'd be the sin of presumption. I can't say I'm saved. I can only say I am being saved. See? Lost people don't labor fervently in prayer to be saved. All right? It doesn't take any fervent laboring in prayer to get saved. You just come to God as a sinner and you say, I know I'm a sinner. I need to get saved. And you come and call upon the name of the Lord in truth call upon Him for mercy, show Him that you fear Him and that you don't want to go to hell when you die, it doesn't matter what you say. You're just calling upon the name of the Lord. You're beginning the relationship between you and God with you calling upon the name of the Lord. That's all that's going on there. To use these verses to try and prove that prayer is a work and that sinners, you know, you're calling sinners. There's got to be some screws loose up here to use that as an argument. I mean, that's the most stupid argument I've ever seen in my life. Using something that a Christian does years and years and years after they get saved and saying that and then trying to make that go back here to somebody who's not even saved and if they do the same thing, then that's works to... Crazy. Totally crazy. Another one that's brought up here quick, we'll look at this one just to show you how absurd and stupid it is. First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. Verse 5, and then verse 10. It says here, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day, as Christians are all supposed to. Christians are supposed to pray without ceasing. See? Not lost people. When you're lost, you come to God as a sinner, pray the prayer, Call upon the name of the Lord. Whatever you say, doesn't matter. Just show God that you're there. You want to get saved. And from that point on, now you pray night and day. Now you pray without ceasing. Before salvation, you're wasting your time. But anyhow, they say, See, she continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. And look at verse 10. Well reported of for good works. Okay, and they say, see, the good works are the prayers night and day, so that means a prayer is a work, and therefore if you pray to get saved, then you're working your way to heaven. Yeah, okay, uh, I've already demonstrated very well that that's nonsense. What somebody does after they're saved has nothing at all to do with somebody who comes to God as a sinner. All right? 
a stupid argument. But notice there too, it's a semicolon. Well reported on for good works, semicolon, and here are the works listed. If she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Five things are listed there, not one of them is prayer. So even to use this as an argument is stupid. It's showing your ignorance of Scripture. To try and tie verse 10 in with verse 5. That's nonsense. Don't fall for this. Is prayer is a work, you know, works-based salvation. Yeah. All right. Is it possible to believe in Jesus Christ and still be lost? Let's look about that. Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter two. Second Peter, chapter two, verse twenty and twenty-two. Okay, it says here, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, head knowledge in other words, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Kind of like, uh, you know, what's worse? A sodomite? or a professing Christian sodomite. The professing Christian sodomite is far worse than just the regular sodomite. Why? Because the regular sodomite, you can still convince them that they're a sinner. The professing Christian sodomite believes that they're saved and continuing in their sin. So they're worse than somebody who has no knowledge at all of Jesus Christ. You know a lot of these uh, church people, the people who go to the big phallus houses and Babel buildings, you know what their problem is? A lot of them have never been converted. All they have is a head knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're false converts. You say, how do you know that they're false converts? Maybe they're just carnal Christians. Look about that. Verse 22. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Uh... Dogs and sows aren't saved. Sheep are saved. So these people are false converts. They were never truly saved. They come and they hear some kind of a thing and they pray a prayer. See? But they don't call upon the name of the Lord in truth. They don't fear God. There's no fear there. So there's no repentance. There's no changed life. And their belief is based upon feelings. It's based upon the emotion of the service that they went to. The music played very softly, and the people singing. Ah, ah, and the preacher up front going, Give your life to Jesus Christ. Oh, friend, if you only believe today, you could spend eternity. You know, they believe, but they believe in vain, you see. Say another example here. First John chapter two. First John chapter two, verses eighteen and nineteen. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, how do you determine who's an antichrist? Look at this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Hello, modern Christian. You get these people that are raised conservative and everything, and they're raised with the King James Bible, raised with the old hymns. They're raised knowing better. And now they departed from it. Now they hate the King James Bible. Now they hate the old hymns. Now they hate your truth that you preach and teach and stand for, they hate it. They hate the truths of this book. What's going on there? They're antichrists. And you know, Paul talked about 
per in perils among false brethren? Did you know that you are in peril among modern day professing Christians? Did you know that there's some of the biggest threats against you? You say, how so? I'd like to talk to you. You see, I understand that you believe very strongly in that King James Bible of yours. And I, I, I respect that, okay? But I just, I believe you're going a little bit too far, okay? And I'm concerned for your safety. I mean, I'm, I'm very worried that you're going too far with this. And I think that it could get to a point where you might even hurt people. And you see, I think that maybe you should go and get some psychological help. For your safety, I'm worried about you. You know, and if they open their mouth long enough, you'll see the split tongue come out like a serpent, you know. What's going on there? We're in perils among false brethren. You know what the lost, these people in these big phallus houses, these people in these big Babel buildings, you know what they want to do to you? They want to put you through psychiatric treatment. I remember there was a TNIV.com, you know, or something like this. They had the TNIV channel on YouTube. They since took it down because they got rid of the TNIV. But I wrote to the people, and I was like, hey, you know, your new version is adding N sisters without any Greek manuscript support, even from the Alexandrian manuscripts. And I was pointing out all this stuff. You know what they said? They said, we're banning you from our channel, and you need to seek psychiatric help. And they were serious. They weren't just saying it as an insult. They were serious that I needed mental help because I was pointing out errors in their TNIV and standing for the King James Bible. And you look at some of these vi vi excuse me, I'll get it out. You look at some of these videos out there of these new versionists, they think King James Bible believers are mentally sick. They do. And I remember my one uh, pre-trib or uh, post-trib thieves, excuse me, post-trib thieves recording, there was a Greek Orthodox priest and he said these pre-trib rapture believers could even possibly do something dangerous. Like, you know, killing people or something. What's going on? We're in peril among false brethren. But if you go to these false brethren and you say, do you believe in Jesus? Absolutely. Well, of course I believe in Jesus. Don't you? We all believe in Jesus. You see? They believe. See? But they're not of us. Why? Because they don't continue with us. They don't continue in the things that has, have been proved and established down through the centuries. They're against the book. Watch out for that. A couple more places to turn to here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I covered this in another one of my videos and some of the brethren did not agree with me and, you know, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind people disagreeing with me, you know. And, uh, you know, they wrote me and, and, you know, were saying things in love and stuff. That, that's totally fine. I'm not against that. But I'm going to show you this again, and I'm going to show you why I do believe this is a reference to salvation and not the resurrection. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Now you see the context there is gospel. Now I know later on he talks about the resurrection. All right, I understand that later on. But you see, here he's talking about the gospel. And he's saying, unless ye have believed in vain. You say, well, I'm still not convinced. Okay, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It says here, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Why would Paul write to saved people, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith? Why didn't he just say, hey, brother, your sister, you're saved, you're definitely saved, you're on your way to heaven, I mean, you're sealed into the day of redemption. Why didn't he say that? Examine yourselves whether you're even, you know, whether you're even in the faith, basically is what he's saying. You know? 
Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Reprobate somebody that doesn't know God. Somebody that doesn't retain God in their thoughts. There's a possibility some of these people were not even saved. Why? Their actions betrayed those of saved people. I understand you can sin. I understand that there are Christians that commit fornication. They mess up. I understand that there are Christians that look at pornography. I understand that there are Christians that get drunk. I understand those things. But when it starts to get into false doctrine, and these, these doctrines of devils and things that are really, really, really far out to the point of you're preaching another gospel? I don't know about those people. And there are a lot of people that I do believe have believed in vain. There are a lot of people out there, they never came to God and called upon the name of the Lord in truth. They prayed a prayer, and they believe that they're saved, they believe in Jesus, but they've never been redeemed. They didn't meet God's standards for salvation. Is it important to pray? Yes, it is. And you say, well, what's this whole thing about, Brian? What's really going on? Well, turn back chapter 2 here to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. It says here, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's what I want for all of you. I am godly, or I am, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. I don't want to see you get messed up. That's why I put together these sermons. That's why I'm in ministry. There are a lot of other things I could be doing with my time, and there are a lot of other things I should be doing with my time right now, but the ministry comes first. And we finally have high-speed internet, and praise the Lord, it's really good internet here, and so I'm going to be able to put out a lot of teaching on the Bible. Praise the Lord. Thank you to everybody out there who's been praying for this. Thank you. Okay? But let's look here. What's going on? Verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. You know, kind of like people coming out and saying that they're King James only when they're not. And trying to beguile Christians. Trying to tell you that you aren't really saved because you prayed a prayer. That you need to get saved the way I present for you to get saved. See? That's the, the way of a serpent, of Satan himself. And by the way, if you read through Scripture, Satan isn't showing up with a, with a bottle of beer in this hand and his arm around a prostitute in this hand. That's not Satan. Satan shows up, he quotes Scripture. That's why you got to know the book. See? That's why you don't rely on me. You don't say, oh, Brother Brian, he's a good guy. Don't worry about Brother Brian, he's a good guy. You need to know the book. I will never point you to my ministry and say, I am perfect and flawless and inerrant when I speak. When I read the Bible, I never make mistakes. I won't do that. I'll tell you, you better know the book. And if you see I'm wrong, you better correct me. With the book. Not with your feelings or emotions. With the book. See? Because Satan is very subtle. Satan will come and deceive you, make you think. If Satan could manifest himself, if Satan had a channel, you know, and whatever, he would. it would not be, you know, Prince of Darkness YouTube channel or, or Satan YouTube channel, Angel of Light YouTube channel. It'd be the Christ, you know, Christian Truth YouTube channel or something like that. And you get on there, he'd be reading out of the King James Bible and changing it occasionally. You know, be very careful. Satan is very subtle. But anyhow, let's continue. Um, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, whom ye have not received, or which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You see, Satan wants to come along and he wants to beguile you and start to tell you you weren't really saved a certain way that you used to think that you were saved and whatever else. And, and he wants to take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. 
And let me just say this. The gospel is supposed to be simple. And because a lot of the brethren are trying to take repentance away and things, I have to talk about repentance and stuff, and people say, oh, he's all about repentance. He doesn't have faith or he doesn't believe. That's nonsense. There are many parts to salvation, but it all is one thing. Okay? You come to God as a sinner. I mean, it's just common sense. God in heaven sent his only begotten son to die on the cross. For who? Good people? No, he died for sinners. Sinners like you and me. Well, then what do you have to do? You come to God and you pray to God and you say, I can't make it in. See, God wants you to come to him in truth. Call upon him in truth. Have you got that by now? See. And you come and you call upon the name of the Lord in truth and you say, I realize there's nothing I can do. I can't merit heaven. My mouth must be stopped because I realize I can't say, well, I kept, I, I, I've never lied. I've never blasphemed. I never took your name in vain. I never, I can't justify myself. All I can do is just cry out for mercy for you, Lord, from you, Lord, and just say, God, save me. Please save me. And the Lord looks upon that and he says, okay, are you here with me in a broken and contrite spirit? Do you really, have you given up on your self-righteousness? Are you going to come to me? Have you come to me? Are you putting your faith in me? Okay. You're saved. You're in. It's simple. It's not supposed to be overcomplicated. And what these people are trying to do, servants of Satan are coming along and they're trying to dissect salvation. They're trying to pick it all apart and remove certain things that they don't like. They're trying to beguile you. And you get all these people out there and they say, I once, you know, I thought that I was a Christian until I met such and such teacher. And now, now I'm really truly saved because he showed me the way. Uh, you know, uh, remove the brain and insert, you know. <laughs> Crazy. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 31. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Wait a second. To declare his righteousness for the sins that are in your past? Well, if you don't call upon the name of the Lord, how are you going to talk about the sins of your past? See, you come to God as a sinner. I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You come to God in a repentant state, in a broken state, and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Like the publican. Okay? You see? Verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he may be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Anybody that comes to Jesus Christ comes as a sinner. You say, well, I'm not a bad person. Okay, then you're not saved. You say, well, I, you know, uh, yeah, okay, I've sinned somewhat, but I'm not that bad. Then you're not saved. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Is that your attitude? Was that your attitude when you got saved? I sure hope so. I really, truly hope so. I hope that you came to God as a sinner. 
and called upon the name of the Lord to be saved? Came and said, God, please save me. That's not false salvation, folks. That's true salvation. And you see the serpent comes along and he says, I have to stop people from truly getting saved. So what do I do? Well, I can't tell them not to get saved. I'll just tell them, only believe. See how beautiful that is? Only believe. And yet there are people in the Bible that are said that they believe. They escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See? They believed. And yet it was in vain, wasn't it? See? You come to God as a sinner and you tell Him, God, I'm a sinner. I'm calling upon you in truth. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. You prove the Ten Commandments to be true when you come to God by faith. Why? Because the Ten Commandments show you that you're a sinner and that you can't save yourself. You cannot justify yourself by the law. That's why your mouth is supposed to be stopped saying, I've kept the law. I wasn't bad. I was a good person. Mm -mm. You come to God and you say, I can't justify myself through the law. But I realize the law is convicting me as a sinner. Therefore, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. See? Throw myself at the feet of the judge and say, Please be merciful to me. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's how the thing works. Turn back to Romans chapter 10. This is where we're going to end it. I'm going to tell you a little parable. Okay? And people say, oh, he's not quoting scripture. He's... Jesus told parables to illustrate points. If the Lord did it, I can too. Okay? Now, I'm not putting myself on the Lord Jesus Christ level. Of course not. I'm just trying to give you a little parable here to illustrate my point about salvation. There was once a city. And there was a very wealthy man that lived in that city. And there was a man who had everything and lost it all and became a beggar. And this man was in desperate straits. He had debts that he had to pay and he realized, I can't get a job. I'm not physically capable of getting a job. There's no way for me to pay this debt that I owe. But he found out about a rich man, the wealthy man in the town, that would be willing to pay his debt. And the man looked at that rich man's house and he, he looked and he said, well, that guy certainly is a big place. I bet you he would have enough money to pay for my debt. You know what? I'm just going to sit here and channel my mind and I'm just going to believe that he'll pay my debt. Here we go. Ready? Hmm. My debt isn't paid yet. I'll, 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 I'll keep believing. No, what the man would have to do, what this man did is, he went to the rich man. He called upon the rich man. And he explained his situation. He said, I'm in debt. I'm in big trouble. I can't. I've been destroyed. I can't make money. I'm, I'm in a, stuck in a, a bad thing here. I have no way out of this. You're the only one that can help me. I came to you because I believe that you would do this, and I have faith that you will help me. Please help me. And that rich man looked at this beggar, and he looked at him, and he... I don't smell cigarettes. I don't smell alcohol. Okay, he's not going to waste the money on that. Uh, what are you going to do if I pay this debt? And the, the beggar said, Well, if you pay my debt for me, I'll, I'll, live, I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll be your servant. The rich man said, really? You'll serve me faithfully? Yeah, I'll do whatever it takes. I just, I, I got this debt. I'm in serious trouble here. I have no way to pay it. Please, please help me. And the rich man says, paid in full. 
So what's that a picture of? What's that a story of? It's a story of a sinner coming to God and saying, I have a debt. I can't pay this. I'm in serious, serious trouble. Right down here underneath my feet, there's a place called hell. And it's burning. And there are souls down there burning. And I'm going to go down when I die. Somebody puts a bullet in me right now. I don't, my body doesn't go Whoa, up like that. It goes down and my soul will go down. I'm scared. I don't want to go down to that place. So what do I have? The only option I have is to look up to somebody else. And to call upon his name. And say, please, please, I have faith. I believe that you can save me from an eternity in hell. Please save me. My Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe the book. I believe because I know what happened when I called upon the name of the Lord. And you do too out there if you're saved. If you've called upon the name of the Lord and you have seen what happened when God saved you, you've seen the difference in your life, you know that verse is true. I told this story before, I'll say this again in closing. I'll tell it one more time. There was an old farm woman that was in a church one time in, you know, Bible building, I realized. But she's sitting there and a pastor walked by and he looked down at her Bible. She had her Bible open, sitting there like this, and he looked down at her Bible. And beside some verses, he saw the letters T and P. T, P, T, P, T, P, T, P. And uh, he said, uh, Sister, you know, whatever her name was, he said, uh, what's that T, P mean? And she looked up at him and she smiled and she said, Tested and proved. Have you tested and proved Romans 10, 13? I have. My wife over there has. Why don't you give a little word of testimony in the comments section. Tell people how you called upon the name of the Lord and the Lord saved you. I've seen it work. So, that's going to be it for this sermon. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, that we can call upon you. Right now, Lord, I'm calling upon you in prayer. And I know that you're listening to me, Lord. Uh, you're not listening to me because I'm a good man. You're not listening to me because I've done great things in my life. You're listening to me because I'm a sinner saved by grace. The blood of Jesus Christ washed my sins away. And Lord, I thank you that you have adopted me and that that relationship that relationship started at salvation when I called upon you in truth. You see, Lord, as you know, I called upon, I prayed a prayer, actually, I should say, as a boy, but it wasn't in truth. I really didn't even mean it. I just was praying what I, I was told to pray. And I counted that as my salvation for many, many years. And yet, Lord, when I came to realize my true self, my true situation with salvation and, and that I wasn't really saved, then, Lord, I called upon you in truth for the first time. And I know that you saved me at that point in time. And, Lord, if there is anybody out there watching this video right now and they have never called upon you as a sinner and come to you and put their faith in you and believe that you died on the cross, I pray, Lord, that they would do that that they wouldn't put it off anymore. And Lord, I pray for those out there, your sheep, Lord, that they would not be beguiled as the serpent beguiled Eve, that they would stay with the simplicity that is in you, that they would not be swayed by these false prophets, these heretics that are coming out and trying to take them away from the simplicity of salvation. I pray for them, Lord. They're so bad right now. But uh, I just, I ask, Lord, that you would please keep us all in your word. Keep the saved ones out there praying without ceasing. 
And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Got to keep my hat on because my hair is kind of wacky right now. But uh, watch out for anybody that's, that's trying to take you away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Salvation is not difficult, folks. Uh, don't have to worry about, you know, prayers of work and this and that. and all. You know, you, don't worry about that stuff, you know. It's just crazy. It's getting really disgusting seeing how people are trying to destroy that simple gospel of salvation. So that is going to be it. Um, thank you very much for watching. Please keep praying for the ministry.